Hello everyone! A couple things to preface this before I get started. First off, for my regular viewers for Akron and Zero K casts, I'm not planning on doing a review show anytime soon. This is a one-off thing because I really have to get this off my chest. And to those of you who are not coming in as my regular Akron and Zero K viewers, welcome! As a fair warning, I do not do a review show. This, like I said, is a one-off thing. Normally I do competitive casts of real-time strategy games, in particular Akron and Zero K, two rather obscure but fairly interesting real-time strategy games. Akron is actually quite relevant to the discussion, Zero K not so much due to the nature of Akron being a time travel based real-time strategy game. So, also, just a bit of small background to the timing of all this. I watched Madoka Rebellion yesterday. I marathoned the entire series the day prior. Now, I may reference Neon Genesis Evangelion or End of Evangelion throughout this. Bear in mind, the last time I watched that was about a week and a half ago. So these are all pretty fresh in my mind. Anyway, also I'm going to not go over the movie. I'm assuming that anyone who is watching this has watched the movie, and I've already spoiled a large part of the original show, but I'm also assuming that you will have watched the original show because you kind of need to just start this movie. I won't be going over any recap. I may be mentioning events just to give context. Anyway, on with the actual thoughts. So, like I said, I watched the movie yesterday, and as you can tell by the fact that this is a very unusual thing for me to do, I typically don't use my YouTube channel for anything really personal, this is something that was deeply affecting, which is a mark in the movie's favor. Once again, this is not a review, just a thoughts, but basically, I wasn't sure what to think of this movie going in, because the end of the show was pretty conclusive. The movie does have a thread that continues off from the end of the show. It is, however, an offhand remark, so it's a little bit iffy if that's actually a great way of continuing, but it does do the job, I think. However, getting into the movie, I really wasn't sure about what happened. I mean, it's starting out with the whole nightmare thing, with basically the whole world having changed again. My thoughts were either, this is the universe before Witches, because it's been established that universes can be completely rewritten. This was an alternate time, well, it couldn't be an alternate timeline. It's pretty clear that that was not possible. As much as there have been other alternate timelines, and possibly prequel timelines, as soon as the nightmares came up, I realized, no, this can't be an alternate timeline. There was a short period between the time where Homer was introduced again, and actually where Monica wakes up again from a nightmare, and then Homer is introduced again. Where I thought, okay, maybe this is timeline two, or, th or somewhere between timeline two and three from the original show. And no, it's not. And the thing is, I think the way that they set it up was pretty interesting. That they had Homer's Labyrinth being her basically trying to build this utopian world of like, super saccharine magical girl show. Presumably she will have been growing up watching magical girl shows because she is a young girl. So it's... I can see that. That kind of makes sense. The thing that I found really annoying, however, is that for about half an hour, or at least what felt like half an hour on first viewing, it wasn't clear that this was actually something imagined up. It wasn't entirely clear that it wasn't just brought into the movie and essentially the writers are trolling everybody. Because in a way they actually in a lot of ways were, or it's hard to tell. The thing is, with that whole opening half hour, you do have stuff that sets it up as a similar case to the original beginning of the original show. And, of course, you have the setup of the nightmares, which is the first thing you're going to think is, okay, what is going on? That, that can't be right. That's really strange. And, of course, if you think that, hold on to that thought, because you're right. The problem is the show keeps, or rather the movie keeps going on this for about half an hour. And that's probably about 15 minutes too long. Because it's pretty clear by the time you get to basically seeing Charlotte that something is extremely wrong. Because that, what is she doing there? And the thing is, one thing that's rather annoying, if it's going to be a lot easier if you, okay, you should have watched the movie first. If for some reason you haven't and are still listening to this, if you watch the show and know nothing about the fan community for Madoka Magica, you're going to have a much easier time watching this movie than I did. I don't know a huge amount, but I know enough to know that a lot of the stuff that they threw into the first half hour or so was pretty fan pandering. 
and honestly it annoyed me. Ultimately, it's justifiable, and I'll get into that near the end of this, but it was annoying, and thankfully it only lasted half an hour, but a lot of that time I was thinking to myself, half wanted to walk out of the theater, and half thinking to myself, please, please let this thing just be some imagined dream, some, well, I say some beautiful nightmare that will wake up to a horrible world, which is what you're kind of used to. I do find it interesting that the show is made creepy by seeming saccharine by virtue of what show it is. But I think the writers took advantage of that a bit too much and ran with it a bit too long because this kind of threw off the tone of the movie. Because the first half hour is a very kitschy, saccharine, typical Magical Girl show, well, presumably typical Magical Girl show, I honestly haven't watched pretty much any other Magical Girl show other than Madoka. So this is more from my understanding from outside. But this, as I understand, is fairly terrible, stereotypical Magical Girl show. The thing is, it didn't break down fast enough, and I think it makes the rest of the movie seem a little bit, partly a bit too dark, and also, I I hear a lot of criticism regarding the ending, which I'll get into as well, and also regarding a lot of other tonal elements in the movie, and I think what happens is that near the start of the movie, the movie seems to forget that it's a Madoka Magica movie, and also forgets that it is the third movie, with the first two being recapped of the series, the third movie. So we know what's going on. We... The audience is fully aware of what's going on. You don't need to recap. I mean, yeah, it's been two years since the show aired, but people probably, whoever's watching this movie probably bought the Blu-rays anyway. I know I did. And they probably, most likely marathoned it pretty soon before the movie, so they're going to be familiar with it. And also, because of the fact that the opening, the way they did the opening has been done like three or four times in the show, and within the show it made sense to do it that many times because of the whole time loop thing, in here, it doesn't make sense because there's no time loop. There's no... Even the universe reconstruction doesn't have that. And admittedly, it does set up a bookend with the ending. So I'll give it that. And it does set up sort of the witch's world. But it's just the fact that it took so long. The fact that it took more than 10 or 15 minutes to get to the point where Homer starts to realize that the world is not correct and starts to realize the whole thing's breaking down. That it takes about half an hour, and I think by the time it's done, the audience forgets that they're watching a Madoka Magica movie, and when it gets back into more familiar gears, it seems familiar, because, you know, it's kind of the dark action beats going on. That's pretty typical, and definitely quite interesting. Fairly awesome. I mean, admittedly, the much-touted gunfight between Homura and Madoka is... Sorry. Homura and Mami. There is no fight between Homura and Madoka, but there probably will be after this movie. Well, I'll get to that. But anyway, between Homura and Mami... There is a gunfight. It's pretty awesome. It... But however, at that point, the problem is, because of the first 30 minutes, had so much fan pandering, had so many things that... like Charlotte is pretty much the biggest example of this. Easiest one to hook onto, though, like I said, she's justifiable. However, there's also just... I guess Charlotte really is the best one to go for. And the thing is, because of that, and there's also... Just a bit more making it your typical Magical Girl show, which seems kind of... Not really for the fans, but it is definitely awkward. And the fact that they've thrown all that in means that the gunfight scene, while awesome and makes sense in context narratively, and actually is one of the reasons why Charlotte is justified, is also something where it's... It feels like it's just more fan pandering, even though it actually does make sense... It's hard not to view everything in that lens. Once you've seen all the other fan pandering that's happened, by that point, you just assume everything else is either fan pandering or possibly fan trolling by pandering them with stuff that they don't really want to see. Or things that you think they want to see, you're just pushing it too far. Maybe. But the point is, that section colors the rest of the movie to the point that it's really to its detriment. The fact that there's so much fan pandering. They could have done that without... Just really could have done that shorter. That would have helped. Honestly, that would have been the big thing to help. I mean, even reducing some of the stuff to do with... Maybe just reducing Hitomi's rule entirely. At any rate, once that's done, yes, it does get into gear. But the thing is... When I say people forget that they're watching a Madoka Magica movie... It's that... As you get further along... Because Madoka Magica, the original show... The thing is, it always got worse. Whatever happened, something worse always happened. 
and there was always some twist that made things worse and there's always some aspect of it that made it you know you thought it was gonna be okay and then it turns out something's worse than you expect or at least and this is the key thing the characters find out that it's worse than they expect but they're not really focusing on that they don't they actually don't care that much about the mechanics of the system a little bit odd i suppose but it kind of makes sense when you think about what you'd be like in a situation where it's like oh cool i got superpowers you're not necessarily going to ask questions you you might i mean i probably would we'd think we would i do think it's is justifiable given that we are talking about 14 year olds maybe not the wisest people because of lack of life experience however it's also not the the twists are not the focus of the story because really twists shouldn't be focuses of the story because once you see it once you have nothing to see whereas the characters being the focus of the story you can keep watching it over and over again and it's still good and the problem with the movie is the second third or so was Homura figuring out, of course, what's going on. Which, admittedly, I figured out as soon as... Pretty much as soon as he walked away with Charlotte, carrying Charlotte along before the gunfight, and walked off a building, and one of Charlotte's... From the fight, the witch fight, one of the Charlotte's platforms popped up under her feet. The first thing I thought is, oh, okay, we're in a witch's labyrinth. And, I mean, it's kind of obvious even earlier. It's, back, back in the night, I mean, it's obvious if you think about it as a possibility, because the nightmares do so much damage to the city that gets healed with so little effort that something is up. But that specific thing about the that plate coming up made me realize, okay, one, this is a witch's labyrinth, and two, it's probably Homura's. Because the plate rose for Homura. I mean, it didn't rise for Charlotte. It was, And the thing is, why would... Once again, we know what Charlotte's labyrinth looks like, so it's not going to be Charlotte. I mean, there was a little... The whodunit section, okay, sure, but... It's obviously not Charlotte, and given that Homura had the plate rise for her, it's obviously her. But at that point, I realized it, and it took another half hour for her to realize it. And in that time, she's going over having to figure out what's going on. And that is kind of interesting. The thing with Kyoko and some of the experiments like that definitely is interesting. But once again, it felt like it was a little bit too long. As in, it felt like maybe it was hinted too soon is a better way of putting it. An important thing to consider here about the original show is that its pacing was its greatest strength. The fact that you went through all the events of the show within 12 episodes with basically no filler. That's a huge part of the reason why it's so good. Maybe I just felt like they didn't really have a whole lot to think about after they got out of the Witch's Barrier. Because the thing is, is there is, once again, another... The, uh, the second fight is interesting. But honestly, I don't... I don't really care so much about the fights that much. I mean, they are neat. And one of my favorite sequences in the original series is the Valpurgis Noct fight. Because Valpurgis Noct fight was... It was just awesome. Homura's amount of planning was insane, or at least the amount of retrospective planning. I mean, she basically was, yeah, basically retrospectively planning out everything because she'd already done it so many times before. But the thing is, that was awesome due to its rarity. That was awesome because of the fact that the battles in which hadn't really been a focus, they sort of were there, and there were some other awesome fights, but they weren't the focus of the show. The focus of the show was the slower moments with the characters interacting with each other and their own developments, their own arcs and such, alongside the stuff that was going on where they realized, holy shit, the world's much worse than we thought. And in the movie, that takes a while to get to, mostly because it's just Homura on her own for the most part, a bit with Kyoko, but otherwise basically on her own. And this probably would benefit a lot from a second viewing. This seems like a movie that benefits a great deal from a second viewing. Mostly because everything seems kind of shorter the second time you view it, so maybe the opening segment isn't going to feel as dragged out. But it definitely, in the first viewing, feels dragged out for the first half or so. Once you get to the point where Homer realizes, I am a witch, and then collapses, then it starts to become more interesting. Then you see the characters really interacting with each other again, playing off each other again. I like that. I didn't like the... Well... Okay, I guess the Sayaka Kyoko thing kind of made sense a bit. I, but I didn't... I don't know. I mean, it worked out with Kyube at the end. That was that was definitely cool. Like I said, that is where the plot thread comes in, of course, where Kyube is actually taking advantage of Homura, trusting him now in this new universe. That I really liked. I really appreciated that they actually made that tie in. It's just, like I said, that's an hour in. By that time, your opinion's already kind of colored with all of the fan service, not of the nudity variety. Once again, just fan pandering more than anything. And by that point, it becomes difficult to really take it as seriously. But then after that point, it helps out. And when I say 
forget that it's a Madoka Magica movie and forget that it's getting worse, I'm referring, of course, to the ending. And the thing is, I like the ending. I think the ending actually fits. I think considering Homer's character, I think considering the fact that if you watch the entire show, if you're not thinking about what Homer should be, like in terms of what you want Homer to be, but what Homer is in terms of her actions, how focused she is on Madoka, how focused she is on protecting her, despite the fact that in the first timeline, Madoka was plenty happy. She's actually, if you can watch throughout the timelines, Madoka becomes increasingly depressed and underconfident as the iterations occur. So Homura is, cons- is consistently making Madoka's life worse for her own sake or out of her own attachment. And they continue that theme wonderfully. And the thing is, this is why, well, partly this is why I say this is one of the reasons people forget it's a Madoka movie or seem to forget it's a Madoka movie. Because, and like I said, I blame the movie itself because the first half forgets that it's a Monica movie until it gets to the point where it just has it's like a bad fan fiction with a Monica characters that then collapses in, in itself and the fact that it collapses in, in itself is appreciated it just could have happened a lot sooner and once again it happened a lot sooner so that people still remember that this is definitely a Monica Magica movie but the thing is the main theme of Monica Magica pretty much other than the obvious be careful what you wish for is selflessness is really 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 hard to do and really easy to mistake for selfishness and the thing is, that ties in perfectly with the ending, with Homura not just getting it wrong on the difference between selflessness and selfishness, but getting it wrong in the definition of love, which is basically the apex of selflessness. That Love and selflessness are basically, again, okay, speaking from a Western Christian perspective, but they are basically one and the same. Like Love is selfless. It's, it's an identity relationship. And... Homura gets it completely wrong. And I appreciate that she gets it completely wrong. I have a thing for anti-symbolism, or I call it anti-symbolism, when you have a symbol that you use as represented for its opposites. It comes up in EOE a lot as well. A lot of the Christian symbology you can kind of take as being used for essentially representing a character being Shinji in this case. That's the opposite of Christ. And Homura's kind of doing the same thing. She's basically sacrificing everything for herself. That totally fits with how obsessed she was and how she was really so indifferent to Madoka's suffering despite the fact that she wished to protect her and that was her whole thing she was focusing so much on protecting her she's kind of bubble wrapping her more than anything so the ending to me really works I think the ending is the main reason why I have a hard time disliking the movie other than the first half because the first half like I said just felt like fan pandering you had Charlotte you had Mami being a bit sexier than before and that kind of bugged me a bit you had because she was pretty she, you didn't see anything like that in the original show. The use of the music, I'll talk about this later, but the use of the music was really gratuitous. It, it didn't seem to fit, especially when you watch the original show and how the music is appropriate for various scenes, especially when it's just used in one scene. And here it seems like it's thrown in at random. They had more like Sayaka, Kyoko hinting. They had the whole gang together as one big group. Like anyone who's trying to think of it in terms of, oh, what would be, like, if there's actually a happy world? Well, they pander to that, and then, of course, they break it down, thankfully, but not soon enough. Charlotte, however, I do think is justified, with the in-story reason being that her and Saika came down from Magical Girl Heaven to help bring back Homura, or bring Homura up there. It doesn't make sense at first, and the thing is, it really is hard to justify in context. This is one of the reasons why it'd be much easier if you haven't really heard about the fan community, because then Charlotte, while still kind of a bizarre addition makes a lot of sense because you might think well Madoka has all these magical girls to choose from why did she choose the one that okay yeah, she's a witch that happened to kill Mami in one timeline I remember that Homer has been through a lot of these timelines and we see Mami survives most of them up to the point of Valpurgis knocked at least well beyond where Charlotte would have come in so there's no reason why it'd be that key of a thing so in that case it's a bit more key because of I mean Homura would know who Charlotte is, having probably fought her several times over, but also the audience knows who it is, so in that respect, it kind of makes sense that they choose her. But the main reason, of course, is because that's the first tip-off that something is terribly wrong, is that Charlotte isn't supposed to be there. She isn't supposed to be a witch, which is not supposed to exist. I like that. That makes sense. What I found more annoying just was the fact that it was pretty obvious that it was kind of pandering because of Charlotte's popularity, but that was more of a distraction than anything else. If I were to put that in the back of my mind in a second viewing, it would be a lot easier to accept that. But still, the fact that I have to justify it is kind of 
or I feel the need to justify it rather, is really a mark against. The thing is with this movie is that there's a lot of good things about it, but... <sighs> and the last little thing for just some small criticism I've heard of other people is the whole witch form for Sayaka and, well, Nagisa and Charlotte basically being able to turn into their witch forms or summon their witch forms. I think it's a little odd, but I think it actually... If you think about it in terms of, say, Persona, the game, but also the Jungian metaphysical aspects that inspired it, the idea essentially boils down, as far as I can tell, to when Madoka saves somebody from becoming a witch, it seems more so that she gets them to get to terms with the despair that would cause them to become a witch, causing them to be able to incorporate that part as part of themselves and then be able to use it, rather than having it take them over, much like the Jungian shadow archetype. Except it's despair instead of just the parts of your personality you'd rather not face. Overall, it feels lazy and gratuitous. And I know that sounds weird because there's a lot of effort put into it. I mean, it clearly wasn't lazy in the art department. It just feels like it took a lot of the surface elements of Madoka Magica, the darkness aspect, the even the, the framing of the first few episodes, took that and augmented it to insane degrees, but didn't... And it eventually continued with the themes. This is why, like I said, the ending works for me because it continued with the actual themes underlying it, ultimately. But it didn't really... It's kind of hard to make that work. I mean, if you notice in the original show, you don't have an arc for any character lasting more than about five episodes. Like, Sayaka's arc is the longest at five episodes. That's not a long time. And even then, there's other stuff going on, but largely it's Sayaka. And the thing is, a lot of stuff going on because of the fact that that's when we find out all the mechanics of the magical wor girls in the Madoka Magica universe. Or Madoka Magica universe, rather. That's when we find out the mechanics. So that's a big twist for the audience. That's a big drawing in point because that's when we find out what really is going on. In this movie, of course, what really is going on is merely a single instance. It's not a universal law. It's just a single instance of what's happening, which is Homura turning into a witch. Well, okay, but... And the thing is, like I said, the Kyubei thing was definitely clever... And it's stuff like that where I think, okay, that definitely plays into Kyubei's character, that plays into Homura's character, and that, of course, plays into the theme of, ultimately, later on with the ending, that selflessness is really hard to do. But it just felt lazy for the most part, at least at the start, and that colors the rest of the movie because of just how much it feels like they're retreading ground and following the form rather than the underlying themes. And gratuitous because, like I said, of the fan pandering, the... I don't know why Charlotte's the only one that pops behind right now. There were many other instances, but Charlotte is the only one that comes to mind now. Anyway, that's overall what I thought. I would like to get the Blu-ray for a second viewing. I don't really feel like going to another theatrical viewing just because it means sitting there for an hour and a half because everyone gets there early. And then you have to wait for an hour and a half, otherwise you'd be missing seats. It'd be really hard to get a good seat in there. But it does seem like it would benefit from a second viewing. However... It also feels like it really wasn't necessary, and a lot of it, it's hard to put out of your mind the fact that it was written, the fact that it was made. It, unlike, and the thing is, Madoka Magica was, from the very beginning, kind of metafictional. I mean, it starts out with a curtain opening, but it also starts out, and this is where I think they got kind of the form wrong, and also with the first movie got kind of the form wrong, is... It starts out with a night with Homura fighting Valpurgis Noct in one of the timelines before the present one, or the one that was present for the first eleven episodes of the show. In this, it doesn't really do that. That's sort of part of the opening sequence, so it's part of the opening theme, and it just becomes a little. It's not really feeling like a nightmare, even though it does have the same sort of waking up from a nightmare thing that you had in the original. But once again, that was done. It was. It's not fresh anymore, so that doesn't help. So yeah, overall, it's hard not to think about this in terms of the real-world writing aspect of it and think about it purely in terms of the story as it's presented because there's so many things about it, in particular, like I said, why Charlotte's there and why there is the Magical Girl, like, essentially the parody Magical Girl show in the very first half hour. Like, it's not just... A, in the original show, it was just a normal life, normal day in the life, and then it becomes really weird really fast, and then it kind of gets a bit lighter, sort of, in the sense that there is some hope, and then, of course, Mommy dies, and it goes in its familiar course. Whereas in this one, it's going straight off into stereotypical magical girl territory, and it... 
like I said, it would only work if it was like, a, like 10, 15 minutes before it started to break down. And then after that, I guess they would have had to have a longer or more conclusive ending. I think it was fine the way it was, but I, I can't help but realize that, yes, this is meant to be open for sequels. And I just... You can just tell watching it in a lot of ways, or at least when you know that's the case, that a lot of this is done because of the fact that the show is so popular, because of the quality of the original show, that it does feel like they really fell into some traps for sequelitis. They, it is a sequel. It was not. A, it clearly was not originally planned. It wasn't written towards. If you look at say, something like End of Evangelion, that was clearly written towards. If you watch the show, you see there's a lot of subtle things going on in the background, which, once again, it's background twists, but they're twists, but what you care about is the foreground stuff. There's enough foreground stuff happening. The background stuff doesn't get overwhelmed by it, but it's still intriguing. And then once it all pays off in End of Evangelion, it feels like it's one complete thing. I mean, when I watched the show, I watched 1 through 24 and then End of Evangelion. In this case, the ending, like the last half, last hour or so, of this one, and if you cut the first hour down to maybe half an hour, 20 minutes, those feel like they're a continuation along the same themes, and the fact that while episode 12 felt like a complete ending, there are, are narrative threads you can pull out, and there are things where you can say it is still an open ending, even though it does have closure. And so it really does feel conclusive. It's just there's so much going on in the first half that it colors the perception of the second half, and it makes the whole thing feel like a cash grab. Oh, and another thing, the music. This is actually the thing that really tipped me off to it being kind of lazy, is that if you pay attention to the music in the original show, there's a lot of good use of leitmotif and a lot of interesting observations you can make by actually listening to the music really critically. For example, Credens Justitiam, Mami's battle theme, and Sagita Luminous, the song that plays at the end of the show during the Arrow of Light sequence, those, if you listen to them quite closely, actually tie in really nicely together, which adds a lot because it makes it clear that Mommy's death really did resonate for Mommy. And it does resonate throughout the entire show. That's a great thing about it. But it's clear in there, too, musically as well. Whereas in this case, the music felt haphazardly used. I mean, they used the, show, the song that they used for the end of the show where Homura's talking to Kyube, Pergo Pugnare, about how she'll continue fighting forever. They used that randomly at the end of the nightmare fight sequence. I don't know why they did that. It's things like that. And the rest of the music, the original music, wasn't that memorable, but I would have to listen to it on its own in order to really make it memorable. But yeah, it wasn't anywhere near as memorable as the stuff for the original show, which is all in my iPhone, and I listen to it all the time. So that's another disappointment, with, especially with a show that had music that was very good and really fit the characters and the setup and fit into itself really well and cohesively. So anyway... That's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you for listening. And I will have a Cast for the upcoming tournament, or the currently running tournament now, as will Cybernetic Pony, who is mostly streaming on Twitch. And that will be better covered when I actually start doing this cast. So thank you for listening, and have a good night, everyone.